I'm starting over in my 60s. And this is really my first attempt at my life that I want to create is in my 60s. And I'll let nothing stop me from doing that. I am 64 years old. I'll turn 65 on Thanksgiving, around that time, I should say. And I'm from New England, Massachusetts born, up to Maine, and then here. Are you full-time or part-time in your van? Full-time. Do you have any other house or dwelling besides no. your van? How long have you been in your van? I think it was two years this August, and I was still in Maine at that time. And what type of vehicle do you have, and do you have a name for your vehicle? I do. This is a 2015 Dodge Caravan, and its name is Sapphire. I just love the color that she is. I call her she. All machines are pretty much called she. It speaks of my energy, my nature. Did you do all the customizations in your van yourself or did you have any help with that? And also how much did it cost to convert your minivan? The biggest thing that was done in the van was getting this floor put in that, that I'm sitting on because I have a uh, mycotoxin illness, a chronic inflammation response syndrome. And I just, I kept reacting to the vehicle. And suddenly one day last year, just about this time, this couple came into where I was staying and they said they could help me with it. So I rented a, uh, a U-Haul van for a short time. So basically it was my house. I tried not to drive it because it's 79 cents a mile, but I, I got my things out and we ripped it all out of here. One girl ripped it out and two more put it back in. And it has made a huge difference in my health. I don't think I would have been able to recover as well as I have if that hadn't been done. Somebody actually did make me a bed and it was so heavy. <laughs> I was driving on a dirt road in Arizona and I couldn't believe the tracks I was leaving behind. So I said, that's it, I'm done. And I got a cot out of Walmart and I have bins under it now with, it's much lighter. I don't have a total, I'm sorry, but my, my expenses are always very, very low. So, I mean, I know when we put in the floor, it was probably, I'm going to say under $200, something like that. Who are you traveling with? My little traveling trio is my three cats. Ender is eight years old, Thaddeus is three, and Babea is seven. Now, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and ask you, what got you into this lifestyle and a little bit of your story and how you got into your van? It was quite difficult. It was around the time the pandemic was really hitting. It was it, we were right on the cusp of that. I was trying to figure out why I was going through this really severe rash. I was on Zoom with a dermatologist and all that. He said contact dermatitis. It was bigger than a rash though. They had no idea. They put me on steroids with Benadryl and all that kind of thing that they do. It helped because it certainly got me out of my crisis, but then they kept like yelling at me to get off the steroids with no other place to go. It happened to me two or three times. And every time I'd get down to almost no steroids, I'd end up with that whole thing back again. It's really devastatingly scary. It was um, complete from head to like about here, red pouring, flaking, swelling. It was unbelievable. So finally I find a naturopath and it was around June of that year that she said to me, the inflammation in your body is five times higher than it should be. I don't know how you're functioning. Go home and get a dumpster and start throwing away everything you want. Um, the inflammation in my body shows it as either mold or lime. It can't be anything else. It has to be one of those two. And since my house was turning green and there was other issues going on, there was no doubt in my mind what it was. At first I thought, no, I won't need a dumpster. And I went, I need a dumpster. If you can't clean it by the recommendations that are given to you, it's gone. That's it, you just have to let it go. Even trying to get through this whole process while being sick, I can't begin to describe it. So I tried to keep us in that house as long as I could and then one of my cats died in the house. At the same time, I'm trying to do a temp job with the Census Bureau. My head's not even clear. You know, my face is swollen. It's, it's like unbelievable. Which dam do I plug first is what it felt like. There was just so many, find housing and you need to do this and you need to do that. You need to make money and the landlord's on my back. and. You know, it was just everything. And there's, there's Sophie, now she's dead. And I, I, I saw her trying to breathe in front of a fan. Cats don't do that. You know, they never get close to a fan. And, and she said goodbye to me one morning. I know she did. And I came home and I found her. So that was pretty much the end of it. I thought I'm gonna go out of my mind. And I nearly did, but I didn't. Once you really understand it and you start to cope with it and you find out what works and what doesn't, then you have some kind of foundation to work with. So that's what I did. I got us all in the car and it changed. I mean, first I'm sleeping on the floor. It's, it's a hard thing to explain, but you, you do the primary 
needed thing first and you just keep going. And that's what I felt like I was doing through the whole thing. It was like, you're on a tightrope. Don't get too upset. I, I can't believe I held myself that well for that long. I can't believe I got us out of there. It, it's been really, really tough. When you had to finally get out of your house, did you feel that you weren't prepared to be in your van at that point? Not at all. I was running an extension cord from the house to the van, trying to go in there to cook and keep them in the car and you know, changing the cat box every night in the car. No, we were not ready at all. So I did the best I could to keep them safe and myself safe. When was the official first day where you no longer had another place to go? I can't give you an actual date, but it was yeah. August that it was it was wrapping up and it was August that we actually left that property. And then I was staying in uh, Irving's gas station parking lot, which was okay. It was okay in Maine to do that. And um, Shell, they kind of knew about it. I was also friended by a community church and sometimes I stayed in their back parking lot as well. I also bought an RV that I thought was going to be our home and that turned out to be full of mold too. So we had to get out of that. And in California, did you find it to be a better living situation or it's just been about the same? Considering that we're in the van, it's a better living situation because Maine is a very different climate than California. And that's the reason I came. That and the ocean. The ocean is a very important part of me. So I'm on the East Coast all my life. And I'm still surprised I'm in California. <laughs> Every once in a while, the GPS will say something and take this road, California. And I go, I'm in California. <laughs> I never thought I'd be here. From the time that you left Maine until today, do you feel a little more prepared? Have there been things you've learned about yourself along the way? A lot of things I've learned about myself along the way. And yes, I am much more prepared. This is probably the best setup I have right now that I've ever had. You learn to take care of yourself. You really do. It kept coming through to me over and over. Don't wait for a doctor to do what you already know you need to do. Don't wait for somebody to come and rescue you. Take charge and get yourself in a good, safe place. And make your life peaceful as you possibly can. Yeah, not just safe but peaceful. Tell me a little bit because I don't travel with pets but you have three cats mm -hmm. and can you tell me a little bit about that experience? There's a lot of people out here with pets, cats and dogs. You have to evaluate your pet. If you have a frightened animal that you have right now, make sure they're safe when this opens, especially cats. There's a thing called running the door that you won't see it coming. You think they're cool. Everything's fine. You don't know what's on their mind. You open the door, the cat's out the door. It's happened to me. If you're scared, they feel it. If you're calm, they feel it. And stay in charge with your feelings too. That's what I do with Indra. So I found out even how to handle her because getting her in and out of a harness was even hard. So when I handle her now, I just keep soothing her. It's okay. It's okay. And I put it on. If I'm nervous, we have a nightmare to handle. They're very intuitive. Animals listen to you more, your energy, your feelings. They know when there's something wrong. And then the other thing, when they are comfortable, I, the cats now stay on harnesses and leashes every day. And the leash is attached to the driver's seat headrest paying attention to things like car sickness. When you're climbing a mountain, it can really bother them. The elevation can bother them, just to let you know, or coming down from one. If I didn't have them with me, I think my focus might have gone other places that it never went because I needed to take care of them, therefore take care of me or vice versa. That really did help us all. It helps us all all the time. And then of course they're adorable. <laughs> So how are you surviving out on the road? Just at the time unemployment's running out and I realize I need to do something different. I was hoping to start a business that I'm still trying to start now called Ancient Healing Light Jewelry or Ancient Healing Light. Anything I do is pretty much in that realm. But I got so injured. I'm still recovering a year later. It happened a year ago. I very, 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 very little to live on. The fear of the gas prices kind of hit. And I, I was in a safe parking program, actually. But I needed more gas to be in a safe parking program to try to sell the jewelry than I would by um, being out here on the streets again. So I had to figure out a way to do that. And I got lucky a couple times. Three checks have come in now from various things that's kind of squeezed me through. And I did sell some jewelry and that helped a lot. It would get gas in the tank and food for the cats and things like that. But that's something I deal with every day. And when this money runs out, I have to be well enough to be able to do a business. And I'm trying to make that happen in a very difficult environment in here. So my hope is to get a bigger vehicle. I'm not making ends meet because I still owe money on the van. I'm making payments on this. I'm also making payments on a few other things, including a storage unit in Maine. And then of course there's car insurance. 
right now I'm living on like 80 a month from my social security check that broke me down into tears when I was in Maine and they told me what I was going to get. I didn't have any idea how I would survive on that and I don't. But a lot more faith in God has made a huge difference. Just believing it will be provided, it will be provided, stay thankful, those two things together ha has really helped. You know what I'm thankful for? The snack pack. All you gotta do is hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, throw a like on this video, and keep watching till the end to hear the rest of Patricia's story. Have you been able to find any type of community on the road, like friends, or have you kind of just been keeping to yourself during this time? Well, the funny thing is, it's both. The answer is both. I kept looking for my community in the beginning. I tend to be an introvert, so it seemed like when I was reaching to find people to be around, it didn't work out so good. And then when I took care of me more, it meant everything if I could just sit still and do nothing a little bit. I really needed to be taking care of my health differently. But I've also found out that there's some really good people that are still my friends, people that I see still that I met here over a year ago. And uh, I'm usually around them somewhere. It shifts around. People just take off and do their thing and somebody else shows up. And <laughs> I've learned to take it a lot less seriously and trust me most. So when somebody just, you, you made a friend and they're taking off or whatever, right? And you go, now what am I gonna do? You know, I feel so heartbroken. No, I, I, yeah, I get that feeling and go, no, you're fine, you're fine. Somebody else is gonna be there, let them go, let them do their thing. Have faith in what's coming next for you. Let the door open when the closed one happens. I got much better at that. I, I didn't have that in the beginning. And you touched on a safe parking program. So maybe you can talk about how you, first of all, discovered that that was a thing and how you got involved in that situation. Well, the police advocated. They didn't give tickets. They would they would put this sheet of paper on their windshield stating that this parking program existed. And there, an officer actually stopped me once too. I was parked at a beach and he was driving around me. He says, you look like you have a lot of stuff in there. And I'd just like to tell you about this. And then this time last year, the police started coming down on people for parking in parks and they're doing it again this year. So I went into the parking program for that reason. I felt like I was just going to be hounded until I got tickets and I couldn't afford these tickets. So I just wanted to get into the parking program. And it was the right thing to do at that time because the atmosphere really changed in the whole area. But then once I got in there, they demand you be in between 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at night. You have to get in within that three hour window. And if you don't make it in, you're on your own. Then they, you have to leave at 7 a.m. And then eight, they'll give you till the weekend. That became a big issue for me when I got injured. I couldn't sit still anywhere and I was in so much pain. It was really hard to stay in the program. And then I tried to get my jewelry business going and it was a lot of gas to get down to the beaches where people go to buy this stuff. The part that is great about it, if you have any concerns about your safety, is you go into this parking program with um, the guards get you in the, the gate. But I believe they're supposed to check your background. They ask if you've had any criminal situations. You know, there's, I've seen some shady people there that had to be kicked out. You feel like you're in a safe environment and they will sometimes feed you. There's a possibility of getting a shower now and then. And there's some free things that come in. Sometimes volunteers come in and they'll They'll give you some things. I think this helped with getting your car repaired if you're 65 or older. That, that situation didn't come up for me, but I heard about it. So they do help you a little bit. And they want you to be on the, the program, we'll say, of getting yourself a home. They want you to be doing the paperwork and the Health and Human Services Department. And there's different programs, but I've also heard people say they've done all that and it, and it still didn't work. So it's a give and take. When you're in that parking program, and you're saying they want you to kind of boost yourself forward to get a job and get a house. Yes. Is that required or is that just a suggestion? Well, there's, a, there's two of them. I can't answer for the, the second one. This is the Jewish Family Services is the one I was in. By the way, right now they're all booked. They have three lots and they're all on waiting lists. That's what they state on the Dreams for Change site. They want you to be committing to doing these things. And if you went into a shelter, it would be the same thing. What are your thoughts on living in an actual sticks and bricks home as compared to living nomadically? I definitely want that, but that's a distant thought at the moment. M mostly I'm going to stay nomadic because my condition and my health is safer outside than it is in a home, especially if somebody else is in charge of monitoring it. I just have to pay attention to my environment all the time. So being in an apartment building complex, it scares me. <laughs> and the other thing is I am just kind of up to here with being a renter. 
And if I own a bus, it's what I want, a small shuttle bus that I can work in, like a studio at the back of it, then it's mine. Finally, at this age, I think I deserve something like that. That's my plan. And from there, I create art and I want to travel and, and share it somehow. I haven't got that part figured out. I want to take classes. I need money to flow. And then if I need to be in a campsite, you just go and you do it. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, if you need the car fixed, you get it fixed. Money is so important. And, and, uh, and this might help some people. I want to mention this. The way I grew up, that was never taught to me. We never had much and nobody encouraged me to become the person that I naturally am. I know that by getting used to the idea that I deserve money and I can have money is a big part of making that happen. You do deserve to have money. You deserve to have independence and freedom and security. And once you teach yourself those things, you can make it happen. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to try to create a business called Ancient Healing Light. I paint and I do other things too. Include, there's all kinds of things I love to do. Any creative outlet you have, go for it because it's never been a better time for people to express their creativity and tell their story. What is something you discovered about yourself recently? I seek to grow more than I do find discovery. Inside of myself, if, if there's something I'm hesitating to do and it's been going on my whole life and I'll think, why? <laughs> Because I have the objectivity enough to know that anybody can be, and we all deserve to be, you know, well and happy and capable. It's just that our childhood has a big impact on us and it, it starts this record player in us. And then when by the time you're an adult, that record player doesn't stop unless you stop it. So I take a lot of those moments and personally mold them into a healthier, happier human being that I am trying to become. Figuring out the family dynamics that I grew up in was a big help to me because at first I was listening to all those people, you know, or, or whatever the ground beat was in my home. Then I started just standing back more and getting a good look at myself and figuring out that I can be anything I want to be. I just need to stop running the record. I find the most important things are to figure out what I want to feel. I tend to really work hard to understand myself enough to get where I want to go. And I don't let things get in my way. I have a big heart for people too, big heart for animals on the earth. So to me, I see it all natural to be a healthy, happy person. It's a wonderful feeling to feel worthy and happy and healthy and whole and you're capable of creating a secure environment for yourself. That feels good. It feels super good. You feel proud of yourself when you make those things happen. I'm starting over in my 60s and this is really my first attempt at my life that I want to create is in my 60s and I'll let nothing stop me from doing that in a calm way. It's a calm attitude I feel about that. If you ever want to do something, no matter how old you are, do it. This is your life. You know, it doesn't matter if you were just born or if you're 80 years old or whatever. It, that, that want is still there, then it's something highly encourage you to go for. I remember my grandmother saying, I wish I had learned the piano. I said, why don't you learn it now, Nana? Well, how old are you going to be when, when you don't learn it? <laughs> you know, I'm going to be so-and-so before I learn to do this. You're going to be that age anyway. You might as well have this when you get there, you know? So just live your life. Your life is for living. It's not for counting days. It's not for what other people think of you. It's for you to enjoy your life. Have your life be your life. I love it. And where can people find you if they'd like to follow your journey? Well, I do have a Facebook account under my name, Patricia Marie Babin. If you looked up Ancient Healing Light, eventually I will have in place what I'm trying to do for my business, whether it's a website with a very positive message for the world. Thank you, Patricia, so much for being on Travel Snacks. And we have a little surprise is that on the next video, Patricia's not only going to show us her beautiful van, Sapphire, but she's going to show us her three awesome cats as well and we'll be doing a full van tour in the next video so stay tuned Snack time. Snack time.